Afghanistan's President Ashraf Ghani has gone. He's left the country as Taliban leaders push for what they say is a peaceful transfer of power in Kabul. Hours earlier, Mr Ghani delivered a televised message promising to take responsibility for the security of the people of Kabul. There is a clear need that the National Directorate of Security, alongside the police and the Afghan army, take responsibility for the security of all citizens. I have asked the Defence Minister and the Interior Minister to convey that message. It is our responsibility and God willing we will carry that out in the best possible manner. Anyone who is disturbing the law and order or things of looting should be confronted with full force. Well, Taliban fighters have been ordered to wait on the outskirts of the capital despite no threat of imminent attack. There are worries on the streets of Kabul about what the Taliban's return will mean for the people of Kabul. Foreign embassies are evacuating their staff with helicopters going between those buildings and the airport. US officials are now working from that airport terminal, while some EU staff have moved to a safer, quote, undisclosed location. Overshadowed by its brutal rule of the past, the Taliban is offering reassurances about the kind of government it will lead. It says women's rights will be respected and those people who worked for the government will be offered an amnesty. Live now to Kabul and our correspondent Rob McBride. So he decided to go. I guess we'll hear him at some point saying for the greater good of the country, Rob. Yeah, it's uh, quite uh, a, a, quite a shock. I mean, we've been expecting all day that to see uh, developments with regard to this transition of power. The the story has been so far that he has been held up in the presidential palace, busy in negotiations with his own people, and of course with the negotiating teams, including the Taliban in uh, Doha, about an acceptable uh, transition, which uh, ev everybody I think by now accepts that would not necessarily involve him being involved. Certainly, the Taliban. Taliban wouldn't want to, to be a part of any uh, new administration with Ashraf Ghani. Uh, but uh, the shock has come that he has uh, actually left the country altogether and is uh, now in Tajikistan. So it does beg the question, where is this transition agreement up to? Is even is there is there a transition agreement for negotiators in Doha to, uh, to agree to, to consider? Uh, so it really uh, adds to the uncertainty as we get into this Sunday evening here in Kabul. We know what I can tell you what we do know. We know that most of the country is in the control of the Taliban right now. Uh, uh, Kabul is surrounded. And the big question is who actually is in charge of Kabul itself? It has to be said that, uh, yes, it's very tense here. It, uh, there is uh, an uneasy tension. But things do uh, remain, thankfully, relatively calm on the streets. Uh, the police and the army uh, are on the streets. Uh, people are moving about uh, this evening. Uh, so so, uh, but there are concerns. I mean, we've had in the uh, taking of the provinces and the area around uh, Kabul, uh, again, more prisons being opened. This has been something that we've seen throughout uh, this uh, the conflict in recent weeks, uh, that uh, as the Taliban have advanced, a number of prisons have been breached and prisoners uh, allowed, allowed out. There was a large prison near Bagram Air Base. This was the former base for U.S. and NATO forces. That prison contained a number of ISIL prisoners. Uh, that prison was uh, overtaken. The doors were opened. There's another prison. This is Polichaki. This is the prison that serves the Kabul region uh, with many more criminals uh, there or people serving time. Again, the doors were open uh, of that prison. Uh, so there is a certain amount of unease in the capital this evening. Uh, nonetheless, the Taliban has insisted that its fighters uh, stay on the outskirts. Uh, they do not go in. They have stressed they do not want to see bloodshed. There should be a peaceful transition of power. And as we've heard, uh, during the day from both the ministers of the interior and also the defense minister uh, for Afghanistan. They too have uh, guaranteed that there will be uh, security here in the capital. And I guess the people of Afghanistan as well as the outside world, Rob, and the region indeed, we need to know the makeup or the nature of this interim administration, government or council. And I suppose that's the explanation behind a Taliban delegation reportedly coming back to Qatar because if they behave like politicians, in their minds, that's clear, isn't it? In their minds, they maintain some semblance of credibility and accountability because they're kind of behaving like politicians. They're not behaving like warlords. 
Yeah, they have to do that, I think, to get that uh, acceptance, uh, especially from the international community, because, of course, people, as soon as you mentioned Taliban, will be thinking uh, about a Taliban of administration of the late 90s and through till 2000, 2001, which uh, does fill many people with dread. You talk to people here in the streets of Kabul, uh, certainly people who remember that time, they remember it with a, with a, a, a definite sense of dread, uh, it's some very awful memories of that time. And despite assurances from the Taliban that there are guarantees now for women's rights, uh, for the education of girls, uh, and so on, there are still very deep concerns. In fact, when we were out in the streets earlier this uh, Sunday and we started to uh, get notification that the Taliban had, in fact, uh, approached the outskirts of the city and that some fighters were being reported, some, some of it erroneously. There was uh, uh, some uh, scam messages going around that there were Taliban fighters walking around inside the city, which wasn't the case. But it does give you a sense of the nervousness here about uh, about the name Taliban, that people were concerned uh, and uh, the, 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 when you talk to people, uh, there is a certain, that many people don't want to see a return of that, especially in cosmopolitan parts uh, uh, like, like Kabul. But there is an acceptance also from people that, given their gains in recent years, recent months, and now what's happened at the moment, that certainly they will be very, a very uh, part and parcel of a future administration. There is an acceptance. Until recently, people were talking about, yes, we have to share a power with the Taliban. That was until a couple of days ago. But given the predominance now and the dominant, dominant, uh, the dominance of the Taliban in the country, you have to ask yourself, what kind of power sharing? The Taliban is going to share power with whom? Uh, it does seem as though they have the upper hand in any negotiations that follow from here. Rob, you'll keep us posted, I'm sure, in the meantime. Thank you so much. Rob McBride, our correspondent there, uh, reporting on that developing aspect out of Kabul. Well, as we've been telling you, the U.S. has been relocating its embassy staff as the Taliban encircled the city. The Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, says core staff will be moved to a safer location. We're moving people out of the embassy to a location uh, at the airport. That's happening right now. Uh, my job, my number one priority, is the safety and security of our people. Uh, and we've adjusted uh, along the way. As I said, we started an ordered departure from our embassy way back at the end of April. Uh, and we've done that systematically, progressively, and we've adjusted depending on what was actually happening on the ground. Uh, and that's exactly what we're doing now. So if no American is in the embassy, we've essentially closed the embassy. It sounds like you don't want to say no, that. No, yeah. we're going to have our core diplomatic presence. We will. Uh, and, and in effect, an embassy at uh, a location at the airport. Heidi Joe Castro following that story for us out of the bureau in Washington. Uh, Heidi, yes, clearly the U.S. administration says this is not Saigon light, but U.S. embassy staff being ferried around on helicopters and getting out as quickly as they possibly can doesn't look like a huge success story. That's right, Peter. And you heard the strained messaging from Antony, Antony Blinken, the U.S. Secretary of State, this morning, essentially confirming that the U.S. Embassy in Kabul will no longer have personnel. Essentially, there will be a small embassy within the airport. Uh, his words with that core group of diplomats who will work to continue processing visas for those uh, Afghans who aided American troops and are now trying to flee the country. He also said that the president the president's focus remains foremost on the safety of getting out those American civilians and diplomats and pushing back on criticism coming also from members uh, uh, from U.S. politics, uh, including Republicans who've called this a, a disaster that was preventable. Uh, Antony Blinken saying that the U.S. had accomplished its mission in Afghanistan in its 20-year war in having prevented another 9-11-like uh, terrorist attack stemming from Afghanistan and that it simply is no longer in the U.S. interest to remain in the country. He also did issue a stark warning to the Taliban saying that any interference in this evacuation effort with U.S. personnel would be met with decisive and uh, a decisive and, and swift response coming from those 5,000 U.S. troops who were quickly deployed, uh, a thousand of whom were quickly redeployed back into Afghanistan when the situation rapidly deteriorated. But of course, there is still much concern, much criticism uh, stemming toward the Biden administration uh, that why didn't they see this coming? Apparently, they had been given uh, 
bad intelligence that it would take somewhere around 18 months for the Taliban to capture the country. Now, as that is happening before the very eyes in just weeks, the question is, why didn't they see this coming and could this have been prevented? Heidi, thank you very much. Heidi Jo Castro there in Washington. Suhail Shaheen is the international media spokesman for the Taliban. He says fighters have taken most cities surrounding the capital but have not entered Kabul as yet. Peaceful uh, uh, transport is very important because if there is a fighting, the, 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 proper, the, power, the properties will be, will be damaged, uh, the people will be harmed, uh, which we do not want uh, that. Uh, so it is very important for that. And uh, the other thing is about uh, future government. For that, uh, we are ready to talk. We do not say surrender. The, the, some of uh, the, the forces, they have joined us. We say they have stopped uh, fighting and they have joined us. In all provinces, in all majority of the provinces of Afghanistan, they have joined the forces and they have handed over their, they came with uh, their weapons and everything. And uh, they, they are, their names are registered. Uh, so there will proper uh, steps will be taken uh, in future for, uh, uh, for how they will be uh, invaded in the government. We will be there, we'll see, uh, we will be waiting, what I said, the peaceful transfer. Uh, peaceful transfer, we will see. We will see that in, in, in future. But our uh, uh, policy and our intention is that our forces will uh, wait at the gate of the Kabul until we, we, are, we sort out a peaceful transfer of the city. Well, if you've been following the events in Kabul city, Kabul province and uh Broadly speaking, Afghanistan, you'll know that events have been moving very quickly day to day. Events are moving hour to hour now. The Taliban said uh, on record, they said publicly, they said in an interview with this channel that they would not tell their fighters to enter uh, Kabul city. They have rescinded that because they say that the Afghan security forces have in effect turned tail and left or they have begun the process of leaving or standing themselves down from their jobs that they're rostered, rotored through. A Taliban spokesman telling the Reuters news agency that they have now ordered their fighters to enter Kabul to prevent looting. That's all we know on that developing aspect of this story. We'll get you more on that just as soon as we can. Our correspondent, Mohammed Jamjoon, reporting extensively, of course, on the long-running talks here in Doha between the Taliban and the Afghan government. He's keeping us company here in the studio. Ashraf Ghani has gone. How does that impact the discussions that we think might even kick off again, refresh discussions tomorrow in Doha? At the moment, Peter, a lot of confusion as to what exactly the agenda is going to be. What we know is that there is a a, a delegation of Afghan government negotiators that is en route. Uh, they are expected to be in Doha tomorrow. What's not known is who exactly is heading that team of negotiators. There's been some speculation that perhaps it's a new team, a team that could uh, start off with a, a fresh slate with, the, uh, with their counterparts, uh, members of the Taliban delegation. Uh, there's other speculation that says that it's Dr. Abdullah Abdullah. He's the head of the High Reconciliation Council in Afghanistan. And the fact that there is so much confusion as to what exactly is happening, the fact that even members of some of these delegations aren't quite sure what is going to happen tomorrow really shows you the, the chaotic nature of what's going on right now. Last week, we covered three days of Afghan peace talks here in Doha. The diplomats who were all here, a lot of them special envoys for Afghanistan, they all wanted to see a way to put the intra-Afghan peace process back on track. The last time there was a meeting of the intra-Afghan peace dialogue was in mid-July. Uh, this is a process that was initiated here in Doha last September, and it really ran out of momentum. And one of the reasons it ran out of momentum was because people didn't have leverage over the Taliban because the Taliban was already starting to gain ground even in mid-July. So last week you had three days of talks. Really what the diplomats wanted was to be able to come up with some kind of joint statement in which they offered a pathway forward to try to get the inter-Afghan peace process back on track. That didn't happen. What you got was a statement at the end of it, uh, you know, uh, asking people to cease violence, saying that uh, any government seized by force by the Taliban would not be recognized internationally, but not much else. And so that made people wonder, what exactly is going to happen next? Now we know also is that the U.S. Special Envoy for Afghanistan, Zalmay Khalilzad, has remained in Doha since the close of those talks. So it seems as though there was a lot of behind-the-scenes meetings, behind closed doors, but we don't yet know what it's going to lead to going forward. 
But there is a chasm, isn't there, that there's a big distance between what the Taliban are prepared to accept, because they, they've been in the ascendancy for several weeks, months now, right. and what, whatever it is that the, the remnants of whatever's left of the Afghan government can bring to that process. Because it wasn't lost on anyone at the beginning of the entire process, going back to September that you're talking about, right. that the Qataris were talking to the Taliban, but the Taliban were saying, uh, anyone from the government? No, forget it. Proximity talks, yes, maybe. You can ping-pong around with messages, but we're not sitting down with them. So they were never sort of fully engaged in the process because the Taliban wouldn't allow it. That's right. And, you know, that kind of goes... Last week, there was an interesting day. The second day of talks, uh, there were meetings on the sidelines of these international talks, and the meetings were held by the extended Troika countries. That's Russia, that's the U.S., that's China, and Pakistan. Uh, these are countries... It's a, it's a Moscow-initiated group. These are countries that meet intermittently uh, to try to consult on how to get the peace process back on track in Afghanistan. And at this Troika meeting, you had both the Taliban uh, in one session and then the Afghan negotiators, the government negotiators in another session, give their plans on how the peace process could go forward. The Afghan government delegation said that they would accept a mediator. The Taliban delegation said they would not accept a mediator. So again, really at loggerheads. And the fact is, you, you can't really find common ground. So... Even then, when you couldn't find common ground, that was before Kabul was encircled by the Taliban. How exactly are you going to find common ground right now? How does this process go forward? Nobody really knows at this hour. Mohammed Jamjoum, thank you so much.